Scott. And uh, welcome everybody uh, to the webinar today. Um, we're going to revisit something that I I talked about. I don't remember how long ago it was, but I talked about uh, rituals of, of meaning and connection in relationships. And we're going to go a little deeper with that today um, because uh, it, oh shoot. I might still be on, but my screen just turned off. You are on. Um, okay, now I'm now I'm back on where I can see. I was trying to hit the volume. All right, um, we're we're going to talk a little more about rituals um, and traditions. Um, not just because of this time of year, although that's that's what reminded me. Um, but whenever I'm working with someone who is new to recovery and hasn't disclosed to their spouse usually one of the first things they uh, they think of, one of the first, uh, I guess, deflections is, well, now's not a good time to tell my spouse because, and they'll have a reason. There's a birthday coming up or there's a holiday next week or, um, you know, it's our anniversary. Um, the truth is there's never a really good time uh, to tell your spouse uh, because there's always something coming up. And, um, you know, disclosing uh, or, or being discovered in addiction is always devastating. Um, so that being said, I think in the background of every coupleship where addiction has been discovered or disclosed, um, there's a lot of heartbreak and heartache around rituals and traditions that were disrupted or hijacked um, or uh, what's the word that I used, um, contaminated by um, addiction and discovery um, and betrayal. Um, it's, it's just human nature to mark the passage of time and, and to mark meaning with rituals, holidays, um, special times. Um, and especially for uh, coupleships, for families, having kind of artifacts, days, holidays, times that are special to us. And this is what we do. That's part of what can be rejuvenating to a relationship. Uh, for a lot of people in recovery, they dread the holidays and anniversaries. Um, number one, because that usually means relational contact with people that you may not um, love to contact um, and, and spend time with. Also for coupleships, it represents a big, big loss. Um, we may remember the Christmases of before, or we may remember the anniversaries of before, the birthdays before we knew. Um, and we mourn the people that we were, the people that we thought we were um, before then. So holidays are hard. Um, and anniversaries are really hard for people in recovery. Um, I think part of what is what makes it difficult is we know we can't go back to the way that things were or the way that we thought things were. Um, things are forever changed. And um, with these rituals, with these holidays, um, I think a lot of people get stuck, pigeonholed, pressured into celebrating a certain way. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about how to reclaim and reestablish uh, rituals, reestablish holidays, reestablish, um, reclaim holidays and rituals and anniversaries in recovery, um, which, which I think is, um, you know, it's, it's on the mind of a lot of people this time of year. I get asked by a lot of couples, will it ever get better, especially as an anniversary or holiday approaches? And, and my answer is, I don't know that it gets better in the sense that it goes back to the way it was. Um, but I'm a, I'm a big believer that new growth comes out of um, death and it comes out of destruction and it comes out of um, endings. Um, and so these uh, holidays and anniversaries, I think are a really uh, great time to, to practice and be uh, intentional about uh, new growth and new experiences. So um, I have just a few uh, I guess, guideposts for how we can maybe work on the meaning of these holidays and rituals, lessen some of the sting and move this toward uh, reclaiming something that may have been special to you before. Or maybe it was always crap. Maybe you've always hated your birthday. Maybe you've always hated holidays and it's been hard for you every time anyone has celebrated it. Um, so these, these uh, principles can also apply to if it's never been good. Um, so first of all is to recognize that this is a triggering time for you and to drop any expectations you have of an idyllic birthday, 
an ideal anniversary or a picture perfect Christmas. Um, drop the expectations and take it for what it is, a day that um, may have some mixed meaning for you or some mixed feeling for you. Um, it may be overwhelming and there may be parts of the day or the experience that you really love. So take it as it is and recognize, um, recognize the triggers um, that will help you to attend to the triggered states. Um, I think most of the time when we have a triggered state and we're not recognizing it, we're not slowing down, we're actually trying to push through. And that will entrench the body and the brain even more in that triggered response. Um, so recognizing and accepting the triggers is a good place to start. Uh, the serenity prayer from 12 steps comes to mind for me here, um, especially the two tenets, um, changing what we can, having the courage to change what we can. And um, the uh, courage to accept what we can't change. Um, depending on what your holiday or anniversary um, looks like, there may be a lot of it you can change. You can decide to participate in none of it. You can decide to completely change the game book. Um, you, you can do whatever you want, or there may be some really um, you know, deeply entrenched cultural or family uh, celebrations. And either way, whether you decide to change what you can or work on accepting what you can't change, uh, that I think most often leads to a better experience, especially when we're able to do both of those without apology. Um, some of the clients that I work with, family of origin is, is difficult and even um, I would say detrimental to recovery in its current configuration. I was recently working with a guy who uh, he just turned some some somewhere in his early 30s, and his mom still wants to do a, a special birthday dinner. Um, we spent one of our last sessions talking about how painful that birthday dinner was that was supposed to be about him, but really it became about what mom was willing to do and what mom wanted to do. Um, and so we we were discussing, you know, why he why he said yes to the invitation and, and why he felt the way that he did. And in the end, he said, I would just feel bad if I turned her down. And so we role played what that might sound like. And the thing that felt best to him um, was being straightforward about how he felt about his mom putting on a birthday party for him and how he didn't want that anymore. And the thing that he had to work on was was doing that without softening the blow without um, feeling bad for uh, causing his mother to feel bad. He had to stand where he stood without apology. And that's something that I think all of us can do, whether it's your addiction or whether you know, you're know you a spouse who's discovered betrayal or has been disclosed to that there's been betrayal, uh, you didn't ask for this. And so you don't have to apologize for this changing your life. You don't have to apologize for this uh, changing what feels good and what doesn't feel good for you in some ways you're along for a ride and just trying to keep your head above water and that's just fine. Um, so when we, can, uh, when we can identify what we can change and we can have the courage to accept what we can't change, that sets us up for the third principle I'd say here, which is reconfigure the meaning and the way that you celebrate. Um, that's been one of the most, uh, I think freeing realizations of my adult life is that I am the adult and I'm the one who can decide what my life looks like, even on days that are special to other people or days that might mean one thing to another person. So some ideas, uh, some places to start to reconfigure the meaning and the way that you celebrate. Um, you might start with the expectation you have that holidays or anniversaries are supposed to feel a certain way. If you look at them, they're most simple. They're simply a way to mark the passage of time. Um, and sometimes the time that you just passed is something that you want to celebrate and you're happy about. And sometimes the time that you just passed is something that causes mourning and reflection um, and sadness. So if holidays need to be a time of mourning for you, that's okay to let it be a time of mourning. Um, that's okay to plan it in accordance with uh, you needing to mourn. Um, regardless of what the time that has passed has felt like, the fact that you're still alive um, is evidence that there's an accomplishment to celebrate, at least in some small way. So I would also recommend reclaiming some of that meaning, reconfiguring some of the meaning that every holiday, every anniversary is a time for you to celebrate what's meaningful to you, to celebrate progress that you've made, realizations that you've had, commitments you've kept to yourself. The other uh, suggestion would be um, 
reconfiguring holidays to be a time that you spend with the people you love, not the people you have to spend time with. Um, where this started to transform for me several years ago, I was really active in adult children of alcoholics. And, um, you know, not only in my family is Christmas a big deal, but there's like six birthdays between my siblings and our spouses and our, our children. So it became like December, it seemed like every free moment was spoken for. Um, and in, in the ACA group that I was attending, we decided that we were gonna have a holiday party. We were gonna have a meal together. We'd done like some white elephant gifts and we planned it, we scheduled it out. And then uh, we got hit with a surprise birthday party that just had to happen. Um, and we decided to keep our commitment to our group rather than um, show up and go to the family thing. Um, and it was, it was a really big momentum shifter for me to realize these are the people that I feel close to. These are the people I've been actually taking my journey with and time spent with them rather than time obligated to spend at a family party um, was much better for my health um, and, and much better for my experience um, during that time. Um, another suggestion would be uh, if you're in a committed coupleship right now to talk with each other about how you're already in a reclamation process together. It's not a matter, re recovery I think is rarely a matter of trying to hold on to things and keep them from slipping away. Um, I think it's more, and I, I talk with couples about this all the time, the, the day you discovered there was betrayal, the day you betrayed your spouse, the relationship you thought you had was no more. We're not in the business of salvaging, we're in the business of starting over. So when it comes to these rituals and, and these holidays, um, you can reclaim this together. So you might talk together about what, uh, what has been part of the old playbook that we really don't like, that really doesn't excite us. Um, recovery has already required you to put everything on the table. So why not these rituals and holidays? There may be some parts of birthdays, there may be some parts of Christmas that you've never liked. So you, you might as well throw out what you don't like and make it about the two of you, make it about what's meaningful to the two of you. Um, back when I was in um, ACA on both Christmas and, and Thanksgiving, my, my spouse was in ACA as well. And we decided one of the ways that we wanted to celebrate those holidays is we wanted to go to meetings on the holiday um, and, and be with that crowd. And that was, a, that was a tradition we carried on for several years. Um, that was really meaningful to us and raised eyebrows with people who didn't get it. And that was just fine. Um, another suggestion I would make is get your meaning first. So um, again, while you might have obligations and commitments to families and communities to celebrate in a certain way, um, that doesn't mean that the holiday that you just have to wait for the meaning of the holiday or the anniversary to be given to you, you get to create that on your own. Um, I did this with birthdays several years ago. My birthday is right before Halloween. And I can't remember the last time someone threw me a birthday party that wasn't also a costume party, um, which was fun the first few times, but it's gotten old. Um, and so one year, instead of sitting back and waiting for my loved ones to plan a party, I planned a party. And that party consisted of hiking to a mountain peak um, and uh, eating breakfast together. And that's how I wanted to celebrate. So I planned that and I invited the people that I wanted to celebrate with. And we did that. And the rest of the birthday, the rest of the, the day was gravy. Um, anything else that anyone decided to give, it bugged me a lot less and it felt like less of a loss because I had already gotten what I wanted. Um, I'd made sure that my meaning was celebrated. And that takes me to my last point. It's that in all of these, the, the reason why any of these holidays, anniversaries exist is because they started with a meaning. Um, and that, that meaning could be a general meaning that you know, a lot of people agree on. It could be something that's, that's uh, personally meaningful to you, but they all started with a meaning. And when meaning is disconnected from ritual, we have ritual for ritual's sake, which I tend to find exhausting and mind numbing and boring and aggravating. Um, so make sure that whatever you decide to do, you're connecting with the meaning for you, whether that meaning is, you know, this is a time of grieving for me, this is a time of mourning, whether the meaning is I'm celebrating my new life, um, whether the meaning is I've made it another three months between the last time I celebrated and now, and that's something to celebrate, uh, put the meaning back in the ritual so that it doesn't have to be a, um, 
uh, a recipe for burnout for you. So that is reclaiming rituals. Um, wow. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I, I always take notes and I put little stars next to things that I want to talk about or bring up and I've got about 12 of them here. So we're not going to get through all of mine. But um, this is a Q&A for you guys. So type your questions into the Q&A. We've got one, but there's a couple things I, I just can't not um, comment on or ask about. Um, the, one of the first things you said was people use holidays as an excuse to not do the work, some of the work of recovery or, or to make, you know, to tell the truth and things like that. And, you know, now is just not a good time. Well, you're right. It's never a good time. It's always devastating. Um, you know, I, there was a year, this was about 10 years ago, and my sister was calling me almost daily for about six months complaining about the man she was married to, who none of us could understand why she married him, including her. Um, and she said, you know, I was like, well, you know, you just have to end it. And um, well, I can't because it's this birthday and it's that birthday and it's, well, you know, so-and-so, you know, and it just went on and on and on. And she finally, uh, they had a big fight on Christmas Eve uh, and she threw him out of the house at 1130 on Christmas Eve. He wow. and his two awful children um, departed at, you know, and it was like, there's never a good time, um, you know, but um, so yeah, it, you know, sooner would have been better, but um, yeah. Um, and I, I just love the need for reclaiming holidays, um, you know, dropping the expectations. Um, you know, I was always as a, you know, our family, uh, my mother, expected us to be a Norman Rockwell painting um, mm. at the holidays and it never quite happened. And it was always, you know, disappointing to her and she would get angry and blah, blah. It was just, it was never pretty. Um, and, you know, um, and I learned uh, as I got older to plan uh, for that. I, you know, I planned some self care, which um, for a long time involved, um, I'm gonna go for a walk and then I would smoke a joint. Um, you know, so I could go deal with my family, um, which was not good self-care. Um, but, you know, I, I have since learned that it's okay to go to a meeting on Christmas and New Year's, and, and I, I generally do. Um, it, it's okay to say no. I no longer go home uh, for holidays. As a matter of fact, one of my first big decisions in recovery was I do not have to fly home for, for Christmas and New Year's. Yeah. I don't have to do it, and I'm not going to. Because... It's a lot of money. It's a horrible time to travel, and it's not fun for me. Um, you know, it's it's an obligation. Um, you know, and and it's one where I don't have any control over my life when I'm there during the holidays. It's all about my mother, who I love, but you know. Um, and then the last thing you said that I, I just have to touch on is ritual for ritual's sake. You know. When, when the ritual becomes disconnected from the meaning, whatever the meaning is, um, it's just, it's pointless. And, and I think about, you know, the holidays that, that I would like to get rid of, and it was all ritual for ritual's sake. It was just going through the motions, and it didn't mean anything to me, and I don't think it me meant anything to anybody else. It was just this expectation that this is what good families do on Christmas or New Year's. Or, and yeah, I'm, I'm so happy that I get to spend these holidays with my family of choice now doing what you know, we want to do and, and having some actual meaning to the holidays. Um, so yeah, thank you for bringing that up. So. Um, yeah, you know, for, for me, holidays have more and more become like a day of why would I wait any longer to get back to myself? Um, and that's something I try to do. I, I try to kind of infuse into every day. If I find myself saying, oh, I need to do this thing that will make me happier, healthier, calmer. If I find myself putting it on the calendar down the road, um, I need to come back to why would I wait to do that? 
Yeah. Um, and and holidays, I think, are a, holidays and anniversaries are a perfect time to feel the pressure of well, this is how it's supposed to be done versus this is what I need. Um, and and to me, it's it's one of the most bedrock recovery principles that we attend to ourselves when we need instead of putting that off again and again. Um, and you know, when you're talking about the ritual for ritual sake. Um, you know, I can't count how many holidays and, and birthdays I spent kind of fantasizing one day it's going to be like this or one day I'm going to feel like this. And then one day I was like, well, why don't I just feel yeah. that way now? Yeah. <laughs> um, what am I waiting for? Yeah. And, and I love also, you know, get your meaning first. You know, the, the birthday party, you love to hike. <laughs> you probably mm -hmm. don't love to put on a costume. So why don't we go for a hike and have breakfast at the top of the, you know, do what John wants to do on his birthday instead of what everybody thinks John should be doing on his birthday. Yeah. I love that. And, you know, um, you know, on holidays, one of my sort of new rituals for the holiday is, is, um, you know, our treatment center in LA. Um, I will zoom in and do a session with the guys on acceptance and gratitude. I have a presentation that I do um, about, you know, the importance of acceptance and, and finding gratitude. And um, I enjoy zooming in for a couple hours on the holiday. Um, you know, I was in treatment over a holiday 20 plus years ago. I know what it's like. Um, and, and I get to talk about acceptance and gratitude and recovery and what life can be like. And it's incredibly meaningful for me and the guys get a lot out of it and it's now a holiday ritual i volunteer to do this on our holidays so that you know one of our therapists can go home and be with family or whatever and you know mm -hmm. i don't have kids um, and i don't fly home and that's that's my meaning um i like to do it mm -hmm. in the morning you know and and then i have my afternoon to you know do whatever you know with friends or, or just go for a walk or whatever um like this year no friends this year we're zooming but such is life yeah yeah i love that yeah. okay well okay um questions we have uh one question in the q a which we'll get to but now, now we have another one good thank you um uh okay this is a great topic uh, my sex addiction husband and i are 16 months past d-day that's discovery and about a year past full disclosure where he told everything that he did um he's working hard in his recovery and has six months of sobriety that's great um, I've been focused on my healing and generally making progress. Lately, I've been feeling just tired of having to deal with the ongoing triggers. Um, with the COVID restrictions, I'm tired of my primary social relationship, being with this person who blew up my life last year, um, even though he's doing well now. Um, I feel that I'm back to resenting uh, that now I have to do all this work and self-care just to get through the day. Um, how does this line up with other partners you've worked with? Um, do you have any suggestions about dealing with this at this point in recovery? What an excellent question. Yeah, I'd, I'd say as far as how that lines up with other partners I deal with, that that sounds pretty standard to me. Um, it's, I always have to work with the, the couples and the addicts that I work with to realize that feeling of unfairness is not a, it, it's not a distorted feeling. Um, it's totally unfair that you now have this, this burden and this reality that you have to deal with. Um, it's totally unfair that you have these triggers that you have to, to care for yourself uh, around um, because they weren't related to any choices that you had made. Um, and so uh, on, on that front, this sounds really standard. And I think that uh, that cycle of, um, you know, some of it feeling pretty good and hopeful and a lot of it feeling just really crummy and why do I even have to be here? I'd say that's pretty normal. Um, what you're describing uh, today, I'm, I'm gonna go on the assumption that this captures a feeling for today and you may not feel this way all the time. Um, so what I would suggest with this feeling right now, to me, this is an indication that there might be some burnout and it makes sense from some things that you said uh, with with social distancing, you're kind of in a pressure cooker with someone who, you know, betrayed you in in one of the most awful ways you could think of. Um, and uh, no matter how much you may love that person, um, 
being in that pressure cooker with these needs, uh, that I think is, has got to take a lot of energy out of you. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in becoming a, a bigger believer every day in the idea of vacation, the idea of intentional breaks um, from life as it is. And um, that would be something that I would um, encourage. I think breaks and, and vacation uh, really help to temper burnout. So what that might look like in this, this situation, you may have some recovery rituals and you may have some recovery regimens that you work every day, some which you may really like, and others may be a have to. Um, like I have to meditate each day or I have to do yoga each day or I become overcome with anxiety. Um, I would encourage you to look at which have tos you might be able to take a break from for a time period and which want tos you would really want to dive into. Um, something that sounds fun, something that sounds uh, caring for yourself, something that sounds meaningful. Um, that one of the best ways to deal with, with burnout is to, to break up the routine and to do something different, uh, to change direction for just a little while. Um, I think it's really easy to pack our recovery full of meaning and full of you know what, what needs to be done so that we can be a healthy person and, and fun often goes by the wayside. So I would encourage you to think of um, you know what's, what's fun for you, what's engaging for you, what, what kind of um, lets you, uh, you know, cut loose and, and relax for a little while. When I was early to recovery, this is going to sound really weird, but my therapist at the time, uh, told me that I needed to connect with hobbies and I needed to connect with what was fun and asked me what sounds fun to you now. And I had a giant block and I said, well, the, the last time I remember really having fun and kind of being in my own zone is when I was playing Legos, probably eight years old. And uh, so my therapist asked if I still had my Legos from childhood and I didn't because when I was a teenager, I decided that only kids play with Legos. So I got rid of my, you know, whole collection and, and that seed sat there for a while. Um, and one day that's what I decided to do. I went and bought a couple of sets and I built and I got creative and, um, you know, I, I kind of did that thing that I did really well as an eight-year-old. Um, and uh, it took me a while to, uh, you know, tell my recovery support people and tell my therapist that that's what I'd been doing because I felt so embarrassed, but it was so nourishing for me. Um, and that's still uh, something that I incorporate every now and then, not just that specifically, but um, as I picked up things like uh, mountain biking and hiking, those were also things I did a lot as a kid, um, just playing outside. Um, and they've, you know, they've now become part of my regular routine, but they're the fun part of my routine. They're the things that, you know, feed me and give me a break from the seriousness of being a healthy, happy, well-adjusted person, because it is super hard work. Um, so I would, I would suggest here designing a little recovery vacation for yourself where you get to attend solely to the things in your life that bring you pleasure and meaning and comfort um, rather than just the hard work of being healthy. Yeah, you know, um, as an addict, um, I, I deal with the same feelings that you're dealing with right now. Um, recovery can start to feel like a chore. Um, sex In sex addiction recovery, uh, you know, your husband probably has a circle plan or a boundary plan, which has, you know, the inner circle where your boundary is the problem, you know, non-sober behaviors, and then the middle is slippery behaviors, and then the outer circle is the healthy behaviors that he can engage in instead of the addiction. Um, and a lot of times as addicts, we have, well, I'll go to you know a meeting every day and I'll go to therapy, individual therapy once a week and group therapy once a week, and I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll read this book and I'm blah, 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 and we forget to have fun. Um, and just what John was talking about, we all need to have some fun. And I think everybody should have a circle plan for their life. And in the outer circle, there should be mountain biking and playing with my cats and, um, you know, working in the yard and, you know, reading books and, you know, for fun, not for education. And, you know, all the fun things, spending time with family or the kids playing games, um, you know, and, and since we're on rituals, um, you know, find some fun new rituals, maybe make it a project for you and your husband to do together. So instead of focusing on, you know, you betrayed me and we're, we need to do our work, um, maybe focus a little bit on 
fun in the future here around the holidays. Let's create a new ritual for the holiday. Mm -hmm. What do we want to do that we enjoy uh, for the holiday? Um, and you can have as much fun planning it probably as doing it. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of stuff like, like that. Um, I also invite you to reframe. Um, you know, one of the things I learned early in therapy was to reframe, I, you know, instead of having to do something, I get to do something. Um, you know, and, and that was hard for me at the beginning, but I've learned that, you know, I don't have to go to a meeting today. I get to go to a meeting today. Um, I get to feel better because I spent an hour on my recovery today. Um, I get to make friends and connect with people. You know, and even though I have to do these things, and believe me, I have to do these things, um, reframing it as I get to do these things makes it so much easier. You know, with that, it's it's not just a it's just not just a cheap trick of saying get to instead of have to. I always think back to childhood when I, um, you know, when I had a need, when I was uncomfortable, that's how my caregivers responded to me. It was, Ugh, there's something else you need. I guess I have to put down what I'm doing and do this. And I internalized a lot of that was that needs were a chore. And, um, you know, through some work with several different therapists, um, you know, coming to, to peace with that inner child and recognizing that when I have a need, that's not a bad thing. And that doesn't actually detract from the overall momentum of my life. That's actually a really special opportunity to slow down and give myself tenderness and care because I can, um, because I want to. Um, there are no, in, in, in my book, there are very few have tos, um, especially when it comes to what I do to care for myself. It's, it's all an act of love. And building on that piece by piece, I think it really kind of takes the have to out of your vocabulary. Because um, who who wouldn't want to do what it takes to be healthy and feel peace, no matter the circumstance you're starting with? Yeah, just just reframing it that way is amazing. Um, the other, you know, you asked about suggestions for dealing with this. I do a gratitude list every day. Um, and in my gratitude list, it helps me focus on what I have in my life and what I'm able to do in my life mm -hmm. rather than what I don't have and what I'm not able to do. And here in the time of COVID, you know, focusing on what I have and what I can do um, has been really helpful because it's very easy for me to get stuck into that poor me. I can't, you know, hang out with my, I can't have my usual Christmas dinner. I can't have, you know, 50 people over to my house for New Year's Day like I did last year. You know, I can't, you know, but if I focus on what I can do, which is call my friends and Zoom with my, my parents now know how to Zoom, so I can see my parents. Um, and I even taught my mother how to FaceTime on the phone, um, although she tends to point the phone at the wall or the ceiling or something. <laughs> but, you know, she's 80. We'll give her a break. But, you know, yeah. the gratitude list for me um, is, is so important on my daily life. Um, but, I, you know, I think I mentioned, you know, part of my holiday rituals now are zooming in with the guys in our treatment center who are usually kind of miserable because it's Christmas and they're not at home. Um, and I get to talk about acceptance and gratitude with them. And, um, yeah. Gra I'm off, off Grat top. Gratitude's a necessity because biologically we are built to look at what we don't have and to make plans for getting it. Um, it's fantastic for survival. It's terrible for happiness. Um, so there, there's very little need for us to sit down and, you know, often make plans for how to get what we don't have. We do have a need to tip the scale in the other direction. Our brains can do satisfaction and they can do, um, you know, gratitude and contentment, um, certainly for small periods of time, but we have to help it. And again, that's, that's an opportunity, not a have to. If I can make myself feel good, why wouldn't I? Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, I do my 11th step every morning. It's my conscious contact with my higher power. And part of that is to do a gratitude list. And, and I try to do 10 things every day. And it really is, um, it's not, it is a have to, but it's really, a, I get to, I get to do this because it changes my whole attitude for the day. And I always have a better day. Um, you know, if I forget to do my 11th step, 
uh, usually somewhere around like right about now, I'll be like, God, I'm having a horrible day. And I realize mm -hmm. I forgot to do my 11th step. I forgot to do my mm -hmm. gratitude list. And I go into my room, I sit in my little, do the gratitude chair is what I call it. And, and I do my 11th step in my gratitude list. So, yeah. Um, um, okay. Um, maybe strange question. There are no strange questions. Okay. When I started my own pro-dependence recovery, um, I requested for my birth certificate. Um, I found out that my biological father had written me off, um, meaning he put his signature on the document with the name of the man my biological mother was still married to. So we have a biological father, and but biological mother is married to someone else. Um, he did not acknowledge his firstborn daughter and rejected me. He also never corrected this fact. So I've been holding on to a name which was never mine. I think unknowingly, I always chased men who rejected me. I believe in generational things and I want to break from this unspoken curse. Um, I never mentioned this to anyone, but I would love to hear from healthy men about this issue. You both, well, <laughs> maybe John is healthy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, so yeah, biological father who did not acknowledge his daughter and now she's, um, feeling rejected and, and and that's feeding her uh, behaviors, maybe some uh, sex and romance behaviors. Um, you know, I think um, whether it's a formal adoption or a surrendering parental rights, um, I'm more and more convinced the more I study about attachment that um, that disruption is always felt no matter what adults think kids can pick up on and, and what they don't that um, felt sense of who you, uh, gosh, I want to say belong with, but more in the sense of like, these, these are my people, this is my flesh and blood. I think that exists in all of us. And so that's, that's a very, um, it's a really big wound to carry. Um, it's a really big loss. And, and I think that's what it is, you know, layer after layer, there's a lot of loss there. Um, so first of all, um, I'm, I'm sorry that the story went down that way. Um, and I'm sorry that there hasn't been reconciliation or an ability to, you know, get closure on that. A lot of these attachment wounds, that's just how they go. They're not wounds of, you know, closure and, you know, quick healing. They're kind of this lifelong struggle with identity. Um, and from the sound of it, what you're writing here, I think you're probably still in the phase of this is about rejection and loss. And it needs to be for a while because that's what it is. It is rejection and loss. And it's okay to feel that. Um, when you talk about, you know, maybe this is part of my pattern that I go chasing men who are not available. Um, you know, as they say, uh, acceptance is the first step. And I think recognizing when, when I see people with these compulsive relationship patterns, often it's that pattern is there because it helps them avoid the, the feelings at the bottom of it. And the feeling at the bottom of this is, is rejection and it's sadness. Um, so I, I hope you can find some rituals. I hope you can find some ways that you can sit with your own loss and with your own grief um, and allow you and that that baby that you were to feel that. Um, that's in, in my experience, that's how we keep things from passing on down the line as we confront it. The term, I forget where this term comes from, but I heard it in recovery. It's uh, being the sin eater. Um, we can either pass down the pain and amplify it, or we can turn and face it and it's not pleasant. Um, and, and usually there's not a, you know, a marked path that we walk. It's kind of what we have to, what we have to figure out. Um, but I, that would be the first place that I would stop is, is allowing yourself to feel and process that rejection. Um, my, my hope is you're, you're working with a therapist who can help with some of that attachment stuff and some of that, that family stuff, um, because that can really facilitate, uh, the grieving, um, um, in that grieving, I think is where we let go of those, those coping skills that are there to cover up the wound and we get to the business of living our life. Um, and, and there's not a certain way that your life is supposed to look. Your life isn't going to start when this loop is closed. It can start right now. Um, you, you can be a person in the situation that you're in 
and be really attentive to yourself, loving towards yourself and chart a completely different course um, for your life. That's, that's what I love about um, the whole recovery thing and the mental health thing. It's one of the big reasons why I became a therapist um, is because it's, uh, it's really hope infusing for me to see that we can chart our own course after tragedy. We don't have to just take what's given to us on our plate. Um, so kudos for you for, you know, doing the homework and, you know, finding out some of these things. Um, now I would, I would just encourage you to stay supported, um, stay supported in that, uh, support groups, grief groups, um, good therapy work, a loving community, um, the, those wounds, I think they can, they can get to a point where they don't drive the bus and we feel them. Um, and I, I hope that's where you can find some peace. Yeah, you know, um, I'm a big believer in, in the fact that family secrets are a form of trauma. Um, yep. you know, when the family is keeping secrets, they are traumatizing the children. Um, and whether the kid knows the secret or not, um, it still tr affects the kid um, and carries into later life. I mean, you know, this one, you're just now finding out about this, it sounds like. But that family secret impacted you. Um, you know, I have a friend who, um, when he was 10 years old, um, he did a little math in his head on his parents' anniversary and realized that his older brother was not his older brother. And he did what 10 year old kids do, which was ask. And then he was told, yes, that's true. Ne never mention it again. <laughs> um, and, you know, and that has stuck, he's in his seventies now, and that has stuck with him to this day um, that he could never talk about it. It was just, yes, that's true. Now shut up. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's research, is there not, that shows that trauma that the family talks about and processes kind of goes away. Whereas family that the trauma that isn't isn't talked about sticks and, and festers. Yeah, even even trauma that I think leads to a better outcome. And I'm thinking specifically about adoption. I think adoption is always traumatic for the people involved. Um, however, the you know intended outcome is um, that adopted child gets to have a family that can hopefully give them what their their birth parent may not have been able to. And so that's that's something they talk about with adopted children is is if if you've adopted a child and that child has a flashbulb memory of when they found out they were adopted, you did it wrong. <laughs> um, there there should, especially in how we talk about what's happened in our family, um, the, I think the best shot we have at being healthy and adjusted is whatever happens becomes part of what we're rolling with, um, whether we want to or not, whether it's pleasant or not, whether, you know, it, it raises questions or, or tamps questions down, the, the power of being in reality and being able to fold in new reality as we move along, that's what makes us resilient. Um, and, and the fortunate thing is that there's never a time that's too late to start that. You know, so things like this, it may not have been part of your story before, but it can be now. Um, you can roll that in with what you understand about yourself and you can be right where you're at with it. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to be something that, you know, completely derailed me from all sense of self and, and whatever. It's, it's simply another, it's another bit of information, another way of understanding who you are and maybe why you feel the way that you do. But yeah, that... It, what Mr. Rogers would say, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. And I, I totally believe in that. Big Mr. Roger fan too. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I have a friend who's a, a, a psychologist who works with adopted kids and surrogate kids, kids who were birthed through surrogacy. And she says, you know, nine times out of 10, the parents want to keep it, oh, I'll tell my kid that when he's 10, or, or and and she's like, no, you, you tell them before they're even verbal. Um, mm -hmm. You make it part of their story from moment one. You know, we wanted you so badly that we adopted you. We jumped through hoops, and that you know, you tell them how it happened even before they understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always part of their story, and they're always they always know who they are. Um, you know, and surrogate kids, um, you know, usually they have two dads or two moms. 
she actually wrote a children's book explaining how to explain to the kids where they came from, how they got there, you know, all the hoops that are jumped through with the egg donor and the, the you know, the gestational, you know, a, a, all of it. And it's, it's really fascinating. And, you know, but the point of the matter is you have to tell them up front um, mm-hmm. and, and make it part of their story and make them special because you wanted them so much um, or, you know, that kind of thing. And yeah, this just feels like the opposite of special, this question mm-hmm. we just got. Um, and, and that's, it's just heartbreaking. So, yeah. Um, okay. Um, next question here, thoughts on telling the kids about sex addiction. Um, uh, and, if, and whoever asked this to ask young adults, but let's walk through little kids versus medium kids versus yeah. bigger kids versus yeah speak speaking of trauma in families <laughs> um, yeah. one I think one overlooked source of trauma is the fact that kids just put together things in screwy ways and it can terrify them i I think I've told this story before on on this venue, but um when my youngest was about oh he was probably three or four, he just turned eight yesterday. So he was really little. My wife was diagnosed with thyroid cancer and she had to have her thyroid removed and do the radiation and all that. So, um, you know, after the surgery, she was back at home, but she had a drain and, you know, there was a bandage on her neck and I'd taken um, a week or so off of work, um, you know, to be at home and and help with things like that. And um, I'm at breakfast one morning with my two boys who are sitting at the kitchen counter. And uh, that time they really liked to talk to each other about their dreams. And I'm sure that hundred percent of that was just made up. It was just something fun that they did. But my oldest is telling my, my youngest about this dream he had. And then my youngest interrupts and says, and then you woke up and mom was there with that thing on her neck and then her head fell off. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> Whoa, okay, time out. I said, what's that thing on mom's neck? And he said, you know, like, her head, it's going to fall off. And I was like, no, no, no. And so I was able to help him walk it through and understand what had actually happened. And then it became something he wanted to show everybody. Like we would go on walks around the neighborhood, you know, to, to keep her, her blood flowing to keep it from clotting. And everyone we met, she, you know, she had the little drain on her neck and he'd say, that's blood around my mom's neck. You want to know how it got there? And he would you know, explain to everybody. And once he knew what it was, he could tell the story. Um, So it's the same thing to keep in mind with kids and sex addiction, really small kids, you have to think age appropriate and developmentally appropriate. So there's two things that for small kids, they're really heavy topics. One of them is sex, just in general. Uh, That doesn't mean we avoid it with kids, but we, we approach it in this gentle joining kind of a way. Another concept that's really difficult for kids to grapple with is being out of control. Even though they are, they don't live in a world where they feel out of control. You know, they can make up stories and, you know, they think magically and do all sorts of things to make them feel empowered. So the concept of addiction for little kids can be really overwhelming as to really overwhelming too. Um, for little kids, when it comes to discussing SA, we want to talk more about immediate consequences. Mom hurt dad or dad hurt mom. Um, you know, we are trying to figure out what to do with these hurt feelings. We're trying to apologize. We're, you know, put it in terms that the kid understands um, so that they have a story about what's happening if there's separation or if there's tension or, or whatever. Again, all those things can be on the table and it's okay. I actually think kids have a chance of growing up in a very well adjusted home, even with addiction recovery going on in the background, if they're folded into those principles of recovery. Yeah, mom and dad fight. We're not happy with each other all the time. This is how we're working on it. Um, That's that's a thing that's empowering to model for kids. Um, When kids get into their teenage years, um, I think at the end of the day, uh, kids aren't stupid and they put things together and they find things out. So as kids get older, it's important to ask them, you know, kind of what they know, uh, what they think about the family, how it's working, and and to to work all the time in the background for a relationship that is good enough and trusting enough that they'll tell you the truth. Um, because your kids may find out things that you don't want them to find out. 
And then you need to be prepared to give them the information that they need to fill in the gaps so they don't fill it in with worst case scenario. Um, with young adults, the best case scenario is that you and your spouse get together and first of all, you two decide on what needs to be told the children and um, why you're telling the children. Um, and then remember with your young adult kids, um, they don't have to, if they don't wanna know family secrets, they don't have to know family secrets. So it's also important for them to know that they have an opportunity to buy in. Um, so once you and your spouse have established, this is what we need to tell the kids, this is why we want to tell them. Um, and again, this is where a, you know, a qualified therapist can really help kind of putting together that, that disclosure type plan. Um, then you, you ask the kids if they wanna talk more about how things have been working in the family. Um, I would recommend instead of a, I, I would recommend maybe starting with the family all together um, but that that can be specific to you know your family situation. But make sure that there's adequate time, um, no matter the age of your kids, to make one-on-one -on -one time to address concerns, fears, answer questions, um, and to not have it. Don't plan these conversations to be. We'll talk about it once, and then that will be adequate. Um, anytime any of this stuff is revealed in the family, known in the family, again, it becomes part of what we roll with. Um, and that's something that you want to demonstrate, whether your kids are teeny tiny or whether they're older, is it's okay for us to talk about this and it's okay for us to have questions about this. Um, so that's, again, part of gauging how much information to share with your children is how much are you willing to talk about on a continual basis. If you're in a place where you're thinking, I've got to tell them, you know, once and then it'll be over with, it'll be out in the open and we can move on, you're probably not ready to tell them in a way that will support both your recovery and, and their health. Yeah, um, I missed most of your answer because I was searching for an article I wrote a while ago. Um, oh, about awesome. How to, how to tell your kids about uh, your sex and porn addiction. <laughs> um, so I, I just put the link in the um, in the chat feature. Um, it's on the sex and relationship healing dot, uh, dot com site. Um, and most of the information in it was pulled uh, from the National Association for Children's of Alcohol Children of Alcoholics. Um, and it says that children need to know four things. Number one, they didn't cause it. Uh, number two, they can't cure it. Number three, they can't control it. And number four, um, it's okay to talk about it. They can take care of themselves by communicating their feelings, making healthy choices. Uh, uh, you know, and it, you know, it, it talks about how children tend to blame themselves. They know that something is amiss. They tend to blame themselves. Um, and, and that's why you need to say, this is not your fault. You didn't cause it, you can't control it. Um, it's okay to talk about it. Um, and you probably covered all of that in your answer, John. <laughs> but, but I missed it because I was searching not, for this not article. As, not as succinctly, that, that article is, uh, you know, that's something to keep in your toolbox um, for sure. Yeah, and, and age appropriate and parents coming together. I, I did hear you mention that parents really do need to come together and plan what is gonna be said and stick to the script. Um, if you have a couples therapist, you know, go over the script with the couples therapist, uh, all of that stuff. Um, you know, don't just randomly sit them down and tell them. Mm -hmm. um, make sure you know what you're gonna say and how you're, how you're gonna say it and that you've agreed on the language. Um, you know, so, and I'm still picturing your four-year-old expecting his mother's head to pop off. <laughs> oh my gosh, there was so much. Uh, I was so excited for him to get verbal because I knew there was just this colorful world inside of his head, but there's so much that I'm glad we, we talked about. I knew he was thinking about because I could help him live in a world that was a little less scary. <laughs> Um, okay, we, we, we've gone through all our questions today. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, John. Um, this was a fantastic topic. Um, if anybody wants to revisit this, I will get this posted on our website and our YouTube channel right away. Um, I'm going to listen to the first 20 minutes or so again, um, just because there was so much packed in there. Um, John will be back uh, in January. And yep, I will yep. be back with him. We'll see you then. Um, have a great holiday season, uh, whatever you celebrate, um, and um, find your meaning first, and don't do ritual just for ritual's sake, and lots of other tidbits. Um, anything you want to take us out with, John? 
Uh, just, I hope you all get a chance to take really good care of yourselves, um, to be kind and to celebrate the fact that you've made it to the end of 2020. Um, even if this was a great year for the world, that's always an accomplishment. So um, please, please take some time to be kind to yourself and um, grateful for, for what you've been able to accomplish so far in your recovery. And we'll see you guys in January. See ya. Thanks, Chad. See ya.